get started. I'm going to jump back into it. Um, the, so the rest of the afternoon, uh, we're going to um, talk about how to visualize some of this, uh, some of this work. And um, Sarah's going to show this new way we have for uh, creating grid data, which is basically making a map. Uh, uh, right? If you want to have a map of what does the rainfall look like, what does the NDVI look like, what does the wind look like, et cetera, uh, we can create the data for that. Um, and you can look at it. Uh, we're, the ideal would be to actually um, be animating the animals moving over a dynamic underlying map. I feel like we're not quite there, but you guys might be able to figure it out even today because I think we're very close to doing that. Um, and then we're also going to go over the Dynamo package for, for visualizing these data. So with that, take it away, Sarah. OK, everybody can hear me now? Um, so, yeah, so what we're going to talk about first is how to submit requests for annotations of all the same environmental data we've talked about, but getting a, a raster as your output. So getting a, a cover, like a gridded annotation over a bounding box. So we'll talk about how to submit those requests, and then we'll talk a little bit about some different ways of visualizing our results that we're getting from MFDATA. So we're back here again, and we go to start annotation requests. And now we're going to choose this gridded area option. And I, there's a little handout going around that might be helpful um, to figure out some of your input here. Um, so to start, you want to basically define your bounding box, which you can type in the coordinates of the northeast and southeast corners of the bounding box, or you can just go into a map. It will not let you select the whole world, just FYI. Um, so pick, choose something you're interested in, and then um, you hit this select button, click and drag, and then you hit OK, and then it will fill those in for you. and then. This, this next, these next fields, so number of pixels and number of tiles. So this is telling MoveBank at what resolution do you want the output in latitude and longitude. And so the tiles are going to be, if, you're, if, you want, um, the estimate, if you want more than about 2,000 pixels in one direction, we re recommend you break that into separate tiles. So you'll get separate images in your results. Um, most of the time, you won't need to do that. And so then you need to choose how many pixels you want. And so we recommend doing this roughly in the same resolution as the original data. And that way, when you look at your results, if it's actually over a kilometer, you're not going to, it's, you're going to be able to tell, you'll be able to tell by looking at the image kind of what, uh, what the res, it'll, it'll, you'll be able to visualize the resolution of the source data, which is going to be helpful in interpreting. So the, um, so you basically just need to figure out how much area, how big is your bounding box, and what's the resolution of your grid, and then calculate what, um, how many pixels you need to keep it in that resolution. So let's see. So here's the example I went through. And you might be able to, if, if it's a one degree grid, you can probably just do this in your head. But depending, um, you may need to convert if it's like a one kilometer. And then the number of kilometers per degrees depends on your latitude. And so I have a link to a little calculator in case you need to do that. And this doesn't need to be exact, but it's nice to do just a rough conversion. So you get, you're generally asking for the right kind of resolution. Um, so I've put an example. It's pretty straightforward. If you guys want to, do you guys want to try and, does anybody want to try and submit some right now and just, like, I can just leave this up for a minute and, and you want to just give it a go? So, so it looks like it, it, it starts with some values already, default values, right? 
Yeah, it's going to, I'm not, so I think it's giving those default values so that the ratio is equivalent to my latitude and longitude, but the resolution I should request at depends on what I'm going to request. So when it calculates this, it doesn't know if I'm going to be requesting one kilometer NDVI or 0 0.05 degree NDVI. So it will give you this, so this is getting, these aren't necessarily what you want to use. Right. I'm just saying it, it's, it's useful as we're talking about think, keeping in mind the resolution of the data you're, you're asking for, um, requesting it in the resolution of that actual source data set is what we would recommend doing. I mean, if you're just eyeballing it, you, can go, you could just go with this, but... It, so what it's going to do from what you've requested is it's essentially going to create that same CSV, but it's going to create timestamps, latitudes, and longitudes across that grid. And so if you ask it to give it to you in a super high resolution, it will calculate it in a super high resolution, but it's just calculating from the same f number of values that's available in the product. So if you, sorry, can you look at your example then? Are you showing it, because you've got to convert the decimal degrees to uh, kilometers or no? Oh, so I see. here you can see, so I just did it for, these are the three uh, down here, aster, globe cover, and the population density. So that's what we've been working with in the other examples uh, during the workshop. And so here I just show what the resolution of each of those um, so none of those has like one kilometer, so then you have to include how many kilometers or how many meters per degree. Okay, so that's actually kind of complicated. So I made a worksheet. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I totally missed it. When I first did it, I was just like, oh, I'm sure MoveBank calculated the values for me. Automatically. Because it, you don't know, it doesn't know whether you're going to request, it doesn't know what you're going to request in the next step. Right, right. So, but you're more likely to request more detailed than you actually have, and the result would just take a little longer? It'll take longer. It'll be, it'll potentially take more time to run your analysis than is needed. And then, uh, to me, like, I want to be able to visualize what this, if it, if it looks pixelated, then I'm going to know, okay, if I've got all these, if my animal is moving within one square of my raster, then the differences in that square are not meaningful, you know, whereas if I've, if I've told it to smooth the output, it's going to look like, oh, it's different in this part of where the animal made this little circle, but it's, it's not. So to me, that's useful. I don't know if some people are working on it. But. Oh. I don't know if people want to submit some requests now. They can. Work on this page and this page. <laughs> well, it's it's I think continue. You're telling it how many pixels to divide up that rectangle into? Is that yeah, I'm telling. I'm telling it right right so within that bounding box what's the, what's the grid of values over which we're going to annotate so if i have let's put in um yeah so i mean if you look at the calculations here so for globe cover i want it to give me 180 va values along longitude and i want it to give me 90 values because my bounding box looks like this. It's longer than it is tall. And so I want it to give me 90 values going this way. And that'll give you, I mean, those, those pixels 
pixels will be a sort of a round number and dimension because you're using a fairly round number for like the, the bounding box. Like the, like yeah, I'm just rounding just so you can, I mean, you don't want to overthink it. So I would just round the whole thing. Yeah. I mean. You wouldn't want to end up with pixels that are 26.7 meters wide or something. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's just like roughly in the same as this as the resolution of your source data. It's going to be interpolated to your raster anyhow. Yeah. Often those grids are kind of projected in a way that's not equidistant at all and stuff. So yeah, so we're going to be resampling from the gridded you do, data. We're going to interpolate to the raster that you fix, and the lengths are going to be funky. So yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't overthink it, but ballpark, don't overdo the resolution by more than twice the native resolution, because there's just no use to it and don't squish the aspect ratio insanely because it'll just, it'll actually not change how it looks, we'll just make interpolation in one axis one much more smooth than the other axis. Um, so yeah, so once you get those sorted out, the next is if you, well, you, yeah, you need to put, you need to put at least, sim same as with our generic time location records, you need to include at least one timestamp. And if you're going to annotate DEM, if you're going to annotate ele elevation or uh, the land use, land cover, like, then it's not going to matter. Um, but if you want to look at locations over time, if you're going to annotate NDVI, then you want to think about what timestamps you want to use. And so um, you could do that however you like. Again, it, it's useful to maybe think about the resolution if you're going to do uh, 16 day NDVI, then you probably would make sense to space your timestamps about two weeks apart. Or if you're doing daily, you might want to do it every day or um, Can you add whatever. like a file of very many timestamps? So, so you, you can like separate them by comma. So if you wanted to do a whole bunch, I would just like make it into a CSV and then just copy and paste it in. Should work. And then if you, you can also open this up and get a little calendar, and then just make sure they're comma separated with no space in between. And you don't need the milliseconds? Well, I guess I'm not going to go back uh, in the future. You don't need the milliseconds? In this one, you don't need the, don't do, don't do the milliseconds. It's the only time. Uh, and so then the next thing you want to look at is the output format. And we'll look at some examples of these, um, but just briefly. So a PNG is just going to be a PNG image file. It's not going to be geo-referenced to anything, I'm pretty sure. Um, then you have this option of a PNG KMZ. So that's a file that you can open in Google Earth, and it will plot it in the right location. And then this third one is a GeoTIFF, and that is a uh, georeferenced raster that you can open up uh, in R or in your GIS software. Um, all of the, so the annotated values will be calculated in uh, one band of the raster, so in band one. And then, because um, for the PNG ones, it's going to need to color them for you. Um, so you need to choose a color scheme to use. And we, we looked, I think we looked at this yesterday briefly too. So we're not going to have a perfect color scheme for everything people might want to annotate. So you can, um, I think it'd be useful if you guys want to come up to me and let me know like what are the things like, like wind is a good one. Um, if there are ones where maybe we need to make some additional um, color schemes so that we can get informative results for other types of variables that aren't included here, that would be useful. So just so you know, like until Friday, this was all something you had to go through this kind of back-end interface to use, and we kind of assumed that the user could take care of these kind of details and under, like had a technical knowledge that so we didn't need to cover a lot of support for this. And so now that we're offering this to anybody who can download data in MoveBank, we're going to need to we're now going to have to like build up some support for um, for helping people use the results, and also we might need to tweak some of the stuff we're seeing at the inter like so we might need to add some more color schemes so if you guys have ideas of things that um that would be useful additions like let me know because we'll be doing some of that uh i'm gonna kind of back up just a hair that, yeah. that uh, longitude latitude stuff 
for choose on map, I got I don't I got a Mac. I don't know if anybody else had any issues with this, but it's not coming. With, the, the select button's not there. Yeah, it should show up up there. Show sure how to work with the geotiff. Yeah, Isn't it too big? It's like a thousand by a thousand. Right? We just try, um, I, I don't know what I'm going to request for this, so. Mm -hmm. But you're requesting a thou 10, by 10, That's more like than this. Is that what it says? It says 10,000 by. Maybe what? Ah, you're requesting a thousand. I think it ca what it calculates is it keeps the shorter dimension as a thousand, and then we'll change the other one so that the aspect ratio is consistent with your bounding box, I think. Is it? It's not a, it's not a hundred thousand. No, 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 we're good. It's a thousand by a thousand. Yeah. It's ten thousand. No, it's a hundred. It lets me drop a thousand it times a thousand is more than a hundred thousand. Select anything. You get it to work? I can figure out here what is the maximum. We'll try and make a big. I'll try. Uh, it's not working on this. Which, what browser are you using? Safari. Safari, and yeah. it's not showing up? I'll, I'll try Chrome and I'll let you know what it, if it does. Okay. Do it. It's working on Safari on my Mac. It is. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to move back in a different window. $100 to have a new Mac adapter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is there a dongle for that? No, it will change the <laughs> And so this option to rescale values to match color map range, I, th I mean, I guess they're just going to stretch the values to kind of exaggerate the coloring um, across the value range that you have in your output. Um, but then we're not going to be able to give you, I don't think that these, these legend mappings will work. I think it will work. OK. We'll have to experiment with that. I'm not going to guarantee you they will. And if you choose GeoTIFF, that's actually going to give you values. So it's not going to give you colors. So then you can go and create. You can actually use, so if you click this button, it will download this little folder of just little text files that show the RGB, the red, green, blue values for, for, for output values for each one of these um, color schemes. And you can actually, I'll show you, you can use that to build um, little files that you can add to ArcGIS or to QGIS that will then create a legend for you with colors that match and then display it all for you with a legend. So I can show you how to do that. And that's another thing I think a little improvement we can make is to just build the exact files that different software types need so for that. we need for the GeoTIFF? No. That we need for the... For the GeoTIFF. Well, for either one. I guess for either one. When I open the GeoTIFFs, it's going to depend on your software. Um, Let's and open a GeoTIFF file in R and show us what it looks like, if we can. We're going to do that. We're going to do it. We can do it right now. Um, do, people have, do people have other questions about this little window here and about creating the input? Yeah. Can I just touch on uh, calculating the pixels one more time? So you have to go back to what we used to annotate our data yesterday? Or, you, or the other thing you can do is, like, if you're not sure, you can go hit continue and browse around and see what it, decide what you want to annotate, and then um, see. So like this one, I want to do land cover. I go scroll down, and where does it say? Three hundred meter um, resolution, and then you use that to do those calculations that I've got on that worksheet. And then I have a little link in there. If you have to deal with like meters or kilometers and converting those between degrees, uh, there's this cool link that will just you give it a long, uh, latitude and it will tell you the degrees in latitude and longitude per mile or kilometer, or whatever. And so then the rest of the interface looks just like what we looked at before. So 
you select variables, and then you select, in this case, I don't have a choice, but if there's options for interpolation, you select those, and then, again, you, get, you review your request, put in, uh, you can name it and give an email address, and then send the request in. You can put multiple. You can put more, yeah. If they're all at different resolutions, you might want to do like one request per resolution that would make, or if they're. Because you have to set your resolution per data layer, so. Per request, yeah. Per request, oh, not per, per data layer. Okay. Yeah. And what about uh, the timestamps? Do you get like a different uh, raster? Exactly. So you'll get a different raster image for each timestamp that you request. Yeah. Hmm. It works in Chrome. But yeah. not in Safari. It worked on Chrome in my okay. computer, but not Safari. I'll try it on Safari on my computer then. No, it works Let's on see. his as Safari. I just, it's weird. But you I gotta get update your Safari. Here. I don't know. Okay. So, next, I wanted to just show a bit about how we can look at these results. And the other thing I don't think we looked at yesterday, too, is just so with these grid results, they come in a zip file. These are already um, unzipped. So you open it up, and then there's another zip file um, in the event that you've got, you've requested more than one timestamp. And then you've got your readme file. So this will show, we didn't, you guys might have seen one of these by now, but so it tells you, it documents what you requested, and then it documents um, the attributes you requested, so that's how you can figure out what are the units and um, give you information about the source product. And uh, there's always, yeah, so there's always a link to how it should be cited. Um, each product has their own um, requests for that. So that's useful to check out with any of these uh, requests. And then, yeah, so it's just packaged up like this. And so this these ones, it was a KMZ request, so we can go We can check these out in Google Earth. And it looks like, I don't have a ton of experience working with rasters in Google Earth, but so it, it does open it up, but then it doesn't zoom to it, just FYI. So if you, yeah, it might not be obvious. You might think nothing happened, but so here I know our study area is over here. And as I start to zoom in, I'll see that it is there. Oh. Yeah. It doesn't. It's not. Can I no. right click it? Okay, well, anyway, this is this, and then we can. So from Move Bank, you can download your tracking data as a, K, as a Google Earth file as well. And so I should have that here. If we want to plot those. Over that, and then we can. Mm-hmm. What's the, the, the green is showing? That's the NDVI. So which file do we have up in here? How can I view the whole? So this is one kilometer monthly NDVI from, this is like the beginning of the June. range of the data for this data set. So that's from, from June. 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 Yeah. Right, so the tracking data is not for, so, so you have to uh, make sure you, so the tracking data for this animal is not from June. Um, so it, it's not automatically, because you're not, you know, you're doing this manually, the grid. So you need to make sure you think about it. It's not automatically remembering what track you're going to show on top of this when you bring it in. Yeah, and so we're, right now we're not seeing any time component. Now, the, the tracks from MoveBank, those have time in there, and you can 
you can animate those in Google Earth, however Google Earth does that. Uh, but the, so right now, and this is what we were just talking about, these raster, these PNG output, outputs don't have any time, as far as I can tell, in the metadata of the file. Now, if we can add that, then Google Earth will know the time for that as well. So it should be possible if we can tweak this, tweak these output files a little bit to then build animations in Google Earth with this. But right now, I don't think it's storing any time information. So we're going to have to experiment with that. Um, if anybody is already knows like how you would do that, come tell us. But otherwise, we'll figure it out. You are my Google Earth genius contact. Figure it out. How do you add a timestamp to this uh, raster? Oh. There's also an R package that lets you do that with a moving, with like a, it's called move this. So you can like. So you're gonna do figure, you're gonna do this in the next hour and you're gonna show us an example. I think Roland has a prize. I have a prize, if people can figure, are you gonna show some more R stuff? We'll do some, we'll do a little bit of R stuff, but you can announce the prize now because some people right. might. If you can figure out, if you can make an animation motivating. of of actual, uh, movement data over actual changing background data, I'll buy you dinner. <laughs> and there's an unlimited number of those. So if three people do it, well, it's only one dinner each, but. <laughs> <laughs> an unlimited number of dinner. If, 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 if somebody does it and you're working on it, you can still finish it today and, give you dinner, and get a dinner. It has to be here, though, in Raleigh. Uh, <laughs> on a computer or on paper? How do you animate on oh. paper? And, uh, Sarah You're going to print out the rasters? And Sarah, the you already have the rasters available, right? For yeah, so I've, I have downloaded the rasters for the same, the same variables that we have been working with, with our example with the Fisher data. And so, yes, yeah, so that's what I'll run through next here. And um, I, I think John and I are going to work this script into the other script, I think, and then add these output files so that this will kind of end up, when we post all the final material, um, this will be integrated in there. Um, but so this is just some really like some basics of plotting these and um, like there's tons of facilities for working the same with any of the other spatial data for working with rasters and in R so this is just some basics but so you can visualize what we're seeing here um, so I'm gonna set my worker drive so that I'll have it read so this raster package is, seems to be like one of like a really key one for working with rasters Nicely named. Um, so you read it in as a raster, and then when, if I just tell it to show me kind of the metadata about that raster, you can see that the dimensions, the resolution, the extent, all this information here is going to match what I uh, what I submitted in in that request in the initial request. And then the first time I opened this file, the the values, the min max values at the bottom here were, they were like, they were wrong. But then when I just ran this little set min max, then it calculated them. And after that, it displayed correctly. So it'll tell you the minimum maximum value in your actual output. And then a couple of quick visualizations. You can um, have it show. I have to figure out where my little picture. It's behind. behind. Ooh, it's tiny. Okay. Let's see if I can fit this all on one screen here so you can see this. So here's showing a histogram of the values in the raster. And so that's a good place. Like sometimes there's values that might mean no data. And so if you have like a ton of some funky value that this kind of helps you see where um, you might want to double check what a value means and go check what the no data values are uh, in in the readme file. And then to plot a map, you can just do plot. And so here it'll plot the raster. And you can change the size. Um, and then you can add a title and some axis labels. And the plot, when you're plotting from the, I haven't quite figured this all, but when's your, some of the plot uh, kind of customization that you can do when you're using R's base plot 
don't work when you're plotting it via the raster package, as far as I can tell. So anyway, play around with it. Uh, but some of the stuff that I tried immediately to adjust the look just didn't work. And I think it's because I'm plotting it using the raster package is what I could find uh, describing why. So we can then, in the same way, look at the population density. Human population. Human, not Fisher. Fisher. So let's see what that looks like. So pretty low population density, but we can see what that looks like. And so the color scheme and the legend, R is just like doing that totally automatically. And I'm sure that can be customized as well. And then if I want to plot the tracks on top of that, it doesn't need all these packages to do it, so I'm gonna have to go back and figure out which ones it actually does and doesn't need. But um, So here, this is basically pretty much the same thing we did earlier in John's code to read in, uh, read in the Fisher data and turn them into a spatial object. But so it doesn't plot it on top of the raster, now it's just taken away the raster, and so um, one way, this is one way of getting them to plot both is you plot your raster again and then with the using the raster package you can plot other things on top of it by putting add equals true and so there we can plot those on top can you extract an array of the values to play with to do so for example wind mm -hmm. the raster of wind makes no sense because you get the u component the v component you basically need to get the numbers calculate, calculate the speed them. directions and do what you want with them well you should be i mean with using doing raster analysis you should be able to do that calculation without extracting it you should just be able to i mean i don't know how you do that in r but like in general when you're doing yeah. Do you know how to access those numbers for mathematical manipulations, not just for plotting? N not in R. I mean, it would be how you, like, I'm not a raster expert. Like, a you can. In the raster package yeah. to do like extract. <laughs> yeah, so there, if you get the GeoTIFF, is the format you want to request if you want to really get those values. And then you can, and then um, that's where you get the complete. If you get the PNGs, it's going to kind of, you know, it's like right. binning your binning your values by the color value because that's all that's the only but data contained it. But, but here you're the geotiff, so the real numbers are here. Yeah. I don't have like script to show you how to do that, but I just want to see it exists. Oh it. thanks. Um, so ex extract you say yeah. is the command? Yeah, and again if people want to like come up here and show us what you know, you should totally you should do it. Um, I'm not the expert. And then Oh, does anybody use QGIS? I can also show you how to do this in QGIS and build a, a legend, which is really similar to how you would do it in ArcGIS, if anybody is interested in that. OK. So let's see if I can do from memory what I figured out. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's uh, to me, it's mostly like what you're com if you're good at doing raster analysis in QGIS or ArcGIS or R. I would suspect, I mean, whatever you're comfortable with or have experience with. Anybody else have thoughts on that or from your own experience? I mean, QGIS is menu-driven, point and click, and R is command line stuff. So um, it's whichever you know. I think R you can probably have sort of endless capabilities of doing things, and QGIS, you can do what they give you to do. The other thing, well, they're both, QGIS is open source, and so I find it to be buggy. Uh, you know, it's sort of a community-driven project. It's not as professional as some other stuff. Um, so. Well, the but, same question might be, would you use ArcGIS versus R, too? Yeah, so I'm more comfortable doing a lot of mapping in ArcGIS, which is what I've grown up doing, grown up. I just don't, I don't have an ArcGIS license, so that's why. So we're doing QGIS. 
Okay, I'm gonna start a new project because I don't want to. I don't want to show you the one I made because then you won't get to see how I made it. So, uh, so people who are, I'm gonna have to remember. I'm not. I ha have not used much. I mostly use R and MoveBank. So, uh, but so we're gonna start by adding one of our rasters. So we're gonna go to layer, add layer, add a raster layer. What do you guys want? You want population density, elevation? Population density. Okay. So I'm choosing the GeoTIFF file and not the Google Earth file. So by default, it's going to plot these values with a, in a grayscale, which might be fine. Um, but so here's where we want to go in and look. Now I wonder if this might not be the, I did, okay. Let me take a look at what I did here. Because this, the population density is one where we didn't have a perfect color scheme. I think I used Celsius. I think this is one I, I used. So. I mean, you can see it's, it seems to be generally showing us. So, so the color mappings, when you, sh when you download them currently, they look like, just ignore the ones that have, the, that have a file extension on them. Those are the ones that I've done something with. But so this is what it will look like. So here's what I chose. Well, actually, in this case, no, I'm not showing the PNG. I'm showing the, so this is the one I did when I experimented with this. This seemed like the closest matched with colors that are within the range of my output. So this is what it looks like. This, so this is for degrees Celsius. So that's the, so the left column here is the degree Celsius of your annotated results. And then it's the RGB values that are displayed. And so I looked into this a little bit. Um, and the, so you can Google this, but so for ARC, GIS, they have a color layer file that looks almost just like this, except instead of spaces, it's, I think, I think it's commas. So just find and replace and change the spaces with commas. And then you can import that to ArcGIS as a, I think it's CLR is the extension. But if you Google like color layer file for ArcGIS, you'll see. Um, and then you can import that. So for, for QGIS, it's a little bit different. So I'll show you. I think I did this one, yeah. So this, so I just had to manipulate that original file to, so I changed the spaces to commas, and then you have to add this other column with all 255, and that probably does something, but all the, I didn't look into what that column is supposed to do, this, all the examples I saw at 255, so I think that. it's the number of levels. Okay. Should be the number count the number of rows that you have. I think it should match. No, it's not. You sure? I don't think so. That's not the number. I mean, I like put in the two fifty five because that's what I saw in the examples. So I'm not. I can't tell you what meaning it has. If anybody knows. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess if you want to, if you could change your scaling somehow if you use something else. Um, and then this column on the right is just a repeat of the column on the left. And so to apply that same, same that, that color mapping and add a legend, you go to, okay, you have to view your layers. So I have to get it to open up the little... Then you right click on here and you go to properties. And then, and I can also, we can add these instructions to the stuff we post. Um, basically, I had to change, change the single band gray to single band pseudo color. So our results are only in one band. Um, then, I think, yeah, from here. Okay, so once you choose single band pseudo color, these extra op options show up down here and this little folder here, load color map from file. 
I choose that. And now I just browse to my little text file I've made, click open, click OK, and there it's colored up with the color mapping that's consistent with. But it doesn't make that much sense because that's for Celsius. So I think we need to develop one of these that's going to be useful for looking at the population density. Yeah. So you go to properties for the layer, and then from up here, you change it from single band gray to single band pseudo color, and then a bunch of extra stuff options show up here. And then this folder button, this is the one that lets you load a color map. And so you can also load any other color map, or you can manually create the legend how, you know, like you would for anything else. Um, but it lets you use the, the color maps that that you can download for MoveBank. I think you just answered it. I was going to say, where are you I forgot where you got the color. Oh, yeah. OK, I'll show you. So back here, and again, if you guys have, so again, this is something that we're kind of doing for the first time. Maybe it makes more sense to include, maybe we should include the color mapping with your results. Um, or like I was thinking, we should just like pre-prepare those files as these layer files for ArcGIS and QGIS and just have, you know, have a folder that says ArcGIS and have one that says QGIS. And they're just tiny little files anyways, and then it just saves you a little bit of time. Um, but so when you're looking at here, this RGB mappings, just click that button and then it'll download a little zip file for you. And that's where I got that from. So from here, there's kind of two things we could do. We could either have some time and let you guys experiment with whichever of these types of things were interesting for you. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is try out this uh, Dynamo program for visualizing the annotated track data. And so uh, up to you guys whether we, you want to. Let's, let's take a break. Okay. Dynamo. Um, okay. And so, uh, yeah, I would say just uh, t try out some animation or try out some uh, loading, uh, annotating some data, making these grids. Um, and uh, it might take a little while for some of them to come through, especially, so do, do small oh, ones. Oh, yeah. So what I'm going to do, too, is I have to do this right now. I'll post these, I'll post the output I got for the Fisher data. And then if you guys want to play with those, you can. I'll just, I'll go post them in the drive right now. Right. Um, and I guess the other thing to say while we're here, the, the next um, program we're going to show animates movement tracks. And it's the Dynamo one that sort of shows, it can show you different points, different annotations on your points. So if you have data you're going to want to play with that, you could go ahead and annotate those points. So if you have animals moving around that you want to add temperature or NDVI or things like that. Wind. Yeah, but wind, you, you don't get wind support though, right? It's just U and V. What, with Dynamo? Yeah. Mm. It calculates. It's not wind support. You give it U. There's the U file and the V file, and it knows the vector fields to do that. OK, or wind, apparently. I haven't done the wind one yet, but that could be cool. So anyway, while you're uh, while in the, while we take this little coffee break, um, and you're making some grid files, you might want to also make some uh, animal point files if you haven't to try with the Dynamo. Um, and then uh, yeah, just if you have questions or stuff, let us know. We'll be walking around. Yeah, and if there's anything in this this GUI that like doesn't make sense, or if something else would be more helpful or informative, or if you guys have ideas, again, we're working. We're our next step of like getting these getting this working is to kind of tweak it so it's it's more user friendly.